Hello, Beatle people, and welcome to the latest installment of Things We Said Today. And my name is Darren DeVivo. I am one of three hosts of this bi-weekly podcast, uh, Things We Said Today. I will let you know my credentials after I introduce the other hosts of this uh, Beatles show. Ken Michaels is the host of Every Little Thing, a weekly Beatles show that's been going on since 1982. Presently in syndication, Every Little Thing combines uh, Beatles and solo Beatles music with news, trivia, and uh, other fun things. And in addition to the radio show Every Little Thing, Ken is the co-host of the solo Beatles podcast slash video cast, which means Ken has to shave and comb his hair because he's on camera talk more talk which comes your way live right that's live monday nights that's right every other monday night but then it also stays online on our facebook page and also on youtube and then the audio component of that is on a lot of different sources on the internet right so it's fun to watch it as it is actually going out live and people can write in and respond to what we're talking about but yeah it's a real fun show and uh, and that was Ken, Ken Michaels, and also Alan Cozen's here. Alan, uh, longtime New York Times classical music critic for approximately 38 years, give or take, but who's counting? And also Beatles critic at uh, the New York Times, author of a couple of books, The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. He's also... Uh, Currently freelances for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other publications. And uh, how are you, Alan? Alan Cozen. Okay, Darren. How are you doing? All right. And I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. Uh, We're at 90.7 FM on the dial in the New York City metropolitan area. And we stream around the world on WFUV.org. And you can hear us on our app, which is... Oddly enough, the WFUV app, and uh, I've been there now for some 35 or so years, and, uh, and that uh, brings us up to date on who we are on things we said today. The topic of today's show will be the second Wings album, Red Rose Speedway, which has just been reissued, but before we get into that, Ken's got a couple of news items for us. Okay, thanks, Darren. First of all, as we're doing this show on uh, Monday night on January 21st, uh, the Bruce McMahon show is being shown right now in limited movie theaters in the United States, the UK, also Canada and Australia. I was a bit surprised to hear that they were doing this, but uh, really nice that it's being shown at limited theaters for one day only. And um, we're going to be talking about Bruce McMouse as it's part of the Red Rose Speedway box set. Also, Paul has added a U.S. date for his Freshen Up tour this year. That's June 29th at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. At the same time, Ringo has added a date in the U.S. himself for his tour with the All-Stars. That's August 28th in Oakland, California at the Paramount Theater. And tickets for both of those shows for Paul and for Ringo have already gone on sale. Paul has also approved a reworking of his song Blackbird for an Animal Requiem concert, which is being spearheaded by Rachel Fuller, the wife of the Who's Pete Townsend. Uh, The concert is being done to celebrate the lives of deceased pets, and audience members can bring photographs, memories they have of their beloved pets to the concert, which will take place at the St. James Church at Piccadilly in London, on January the 31st, and there will be a full choir and orchestral performance of the Animal Requiem, and there'll also be a CD made as part of a, what they're calling a morning pack that people can acquire when a pet passes. So this was news that just broke over the last couple of days. Why didn't they do wildlife? Maybe because they didn't didn't want to say aminals. (laughs) I was just going to say, because the whole event is for animals, <laughs> not animals. <laughs> well, that might have been the song that Rachel requested from Paul. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Paul's brother, Michael, as we all know, released an album in 1974 called McGear, 
And, uh, and not only had Paul all over the album, but other members of Wings. A lot of people consider it a Wings album. We've been talking about this here on the show, and uh, we know that a new reissue is coming out. First, I heard it was coming out in February because I heard Mike talk about it on uh, an interview he gave in the UK. Now I'm hearing it's coming out in April. Uh, it will be released in a clamshell CD DVD set and also on a 100 gram vinyl. Uh, the McGear albums, uh, I think, has been out of out of print for for ages, and I could be wrong about this, but the last time I've ever seen it in this country was when Ryko Disc Records uh, issued it. In the, it had to be in the nineties, so mid nineties right. maybe. Mm-hmm. So, it'd be nice to have that available again. Yeah, well, there's, it is there's very thousands. much like you said, like a Wings album. Yeah, there's supposed to be a lot of bonus material on there, whereas the uh, Ryko Disc, I think, had just. Uh, one bonus track on there dance the do uh but i think there's going to be a lot more coming with this and as we hear more we'll be sure to pass it along to everybody uh last friday saw the release of the john lennon 75th birthday concert which was held at new york's madison square garden uh with legendary singers and artists performing john songs it's just come out as a two cd or cd dvd or lp on uh, January the 18th, among the many people who performed John Lennon's songs were Sheryl Crow, John Fogarty, Willie Nelson, Peter Frampton, and others. But that's just been released for all of you who collect uh, cover versions of Beatle and solo Beatle material. That kind of came out of nowhere, that release. Yeah, well, there was this concert that took place shortly after what would have been John's birthday. And so the last few years, they've had this recording available. So plans, I guess, were underway for this. And uh, I love seeing all these tribute shows. And I love listening to different cover versions of songs. So um, if any of the artists who are part of the roster of this concert appeal to you, it's certainly something to check out. So you can order it now on Amazon, the John Lennon 75th birthday concert. Also, Ringo's 1978 album, Bad Boy. It's coming out on a 180 gram vinyl translucent blue and black swirl. Um, it was mastered by Joe Ragoso at Friday Music and Capitol Records. It has a striking gatefold cover and a 12 by 12 poster insert. It'll be selling for $32.98 at FridayMusic.com. The expected shipping date is this Wednesday. Now, wait a minute. I'm confused. Mm-hmm. Mad Boy, I thought, has been reissued on vinyl on two different occasions in the last couple of years. Yep. So now we're getting a third vinyl. Well, I know, yes, I know but it's recently. translucent. Yes. <laughs> hey, you know how Beatle fans are. There are people yeah. who pick this stuff up. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I saw it, when the first one, one colored vinyl came out, I thought, huh? You know, it seems sort of random. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I bought it. And then there was the second one, a different color vinyl, and I can't remember... This was, I think, both last year. Uh, but uh, now we've got another one to pick up. All right, good for Ringo. Okay. And save up for that one, Darren. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still licking my wounds from all the releases starting in September. Hmm. Okay, uh, trumpet player Steve Medeo has passed away. He played at two of rock's most historic concerts at Monterey Pop and at Woodstock. And he was on countless records as a studio player, including John's Walls and Bridges album. He was part of the Little Big Horns. And uh, that group was on most of the tracks on Walls and Bridges. He also played on Ringo's Good Night Vienna album, including the title track and the song All By Myself, for which he had a trumpet solo. And uh, it happens to be Steve who played the distinctive trumpet part in Stevie Wonder's Superstition along with uh, other major hits from Stevie, like I Wish and Sir Duke. And he died January 15th of a heart attack. Very sad news to hear here. Uh Egypt Station. (laughs) If it wasn't for Steve Marinucci, I wouldn't even know about this. But as you know, uh, Amazon has their own music charts, and there is a bluegrass chart on Amazon. And Egypt Station is the number one album on the bluegrass charts. How does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> I can't figure that out, but for some reason, it's on their charts, the bluegrass charts. Did you look? Did you see it? Yeah, I did. I went online. It's right there at number one. 
Huh. All right. Maybe we'll have to interview because somebody at Amazon to explain this, but... Next, the translucent vinyl version of Bad Boy will be on the jazz charts. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Uh, Ringo is also on the front cover of the December-January issue of Drumheads magazine. I haven't picked that up, but for those of you interested, he's right there. Um, also, we send out happy birthday wishes to Richard Lester, who turned 87... I think that was a couple of days ago. Also, uh, Mark Lapidos turned 71. Yesterday, Paul's guitar player, Rusty Anderson, turned 60. <laughs> That's uh, all the know, news I have for you. You know, let me, I don't have the details in front of me because I just found out about it literally within an hour of us starting to record this show. But uh, Brian mm -hmm. Ray, uh, <laughs> the other guitarist <laughs> in McCartney's band, has a single uh, that he's releasing or about to release, and it's going to be available on single. Uh, I didn't have a chance to really uh, find out the details on that, but um, just look up Brian Ray and see what the deal is with the, a new a new song he has, and that will be available as a vinyl single. Okay, very good. I know Brian released something recently, his own cover of uh, a Smokey Robinson song, mm -hmm. and um, that was several months ago. But he does release stuff on his own, you know. Plus, he's got his band, The Bayonets. Mm -hmm. uh, right, you know, right. in addition to uh, working with Paul. All right, so let's let's talk about Red Rose Speedway. All right. Well, as everyone knows, I'm sure, but just to recap, on December seventh, the latest uh, entries into the Paul McCartney Archive Collection uh, were released. In this case, it was um, the first two Wings albums, the third and fourth albums for Paul following the Beatles breakup. The first Wings album, Wildlife, which was the topic of our show last time. Uh, we discussed the uh, deluxe reissue of Wildlife. The other entry into the Paul McCartney Archive Collection is the reissue of the second Wings album, Red Rose Speedway, which is the topic of today's show. Of course, both box sets were then combined into a third box set with additional material uh, that was gone before it ever appeared it seemed as though and that was titled simply paul mccartney and wings 1971 to 1973 but we are uh, as we talked as i mentioned last time we talked about wildlife today we're spending time with red rose speedway uh again from the spring of 1973 it was the second wings album and it was paul's fourth album overall following the beetle breakup and was technically the first of two albums credited to Paul McCartney and Wings, which I can only assume was the record company trying to make it clear that this band, relatively new band Wings, featured the former Beatle, that they uh, altered the billing for Red Rose Speedway, and it would stay that way through almost every release to the end of 1974. So this is a great box set, audio-wise, Music-wise, I really enjoy this set. Uh, but let's start with Alan and or Ken's thoughts on uh, the new deluxe Red Rose Speedway. Let's start with Ken. <laughs> I have a feeling you're going to bounce off a lot of things that I'm about to say. I really think that we should we should talk just briefly about the album itself, the original album, and what we think of it, sure. if that's okay. Yeah. okay. Because Red, Red Rose Speedway, to me, is an album I've always loved. And one of the many reasons why I love the Beatles music group and solo is how strong their melodies are. And many people could argue that Paul is the greatest, if not one of the greatest melodic songwriters of all time. And the melodies on this album are just absolutely fantastic. And the arrangements are great. His voice is great. I love the arrangements of all the songs. Some of his best work to me is here, although you could say that about so many of his albums. But um, there's a lot of songs here on this album that I really like. In fact, I would call it, in, this is just my opinion, this is like a near-perfect album for me, with the possible exception of maybe Single Pigeon, which to me is an okay song, I like it, but I like everything else on this album. And Side One, to me, is as perfect as you can get. Little Lamb Dragonfly, I would rate as being one of the greatest songs in Paul's entire canon. 
and uh, you know, my love is is pretty much established as you know a classic love song in, in Paul McCartney's body of work, and I, I just love so much about this record. Get on the right thing is a terrific track. Big Barn Bed is a great opening number. I could have seen that as a follow up single from My Love, but then Paul already had Live and Let Die ready to release. Also, the medley on side two I thought was absolutely brilliant. Paul has a way of taking these short songs, combining them in a way where it all flows, and at the very end of the whole medley, playing them all simultaneously in a way which I thought was so completely brilliant. When the Night is a quirky little number in an odd time signature, which I think is very unique in its, in its song structure that way. I love the whole arrangement of that song. And I, I know I'll be in a minority here, but I really love Loop as an instrumental because I think it represents some of Paul's more experimental side, which I wish he would do more of um, in his solo career. But, um, you know, overall, I just um, I think this is a near flawless album. One of the things that I'm sure we'll probably discuss, because the box set goes into the double album of what was proposed originally as a double album. And once you add all the other material that could have made a double album, it made it a much more, I would say, eclectic, if you want to use that word. But there was much there were more rockers once you add those songs. And if. Red Rose Speedway has any fault at all, it needed a little bit of edge, a few songs that rocked more with edge. But in terms of beautiful melodies, beautiful arrangements, this album is, is you know, spectacular, in my opinion. Now, before Alan, before you jump in, I know that Alan, as we discussed on the last show, isn't the biggest wildlife fan. Right. Okay, without getting into details, it's not one of Alan's favorite McCartney reference. Okay, so... Before you talk about your thoughts on Red Rose Speedway, could you begin, if I could ask you to do this, Alan, mm -hmm. to your, if you remember, your initial impressions. I'm um, assuming you heard you you got Red Rose Speedway when it was newly released, following uh, Wildlife. I did not what? get Red Rose Speedway when it was newly released, or Wildlife when it was newly released. I caught up with those later. Um, uh, I, I do okay. remember, well, you know, at that point... I was kind of off Paul McCartney records. I had heard, I didn't like a lot of Ram. I like a lot of it now, but I didn't like a lot of it then. Particularly, I, I think my entire attitude towards Ram was colored by Uncle Albert, which I hated and still seriously dislike. Then I heard the Wildlife album, and I thought it was just sort of ramshackle and disappointing and i thought okay you know he's just sort of uh lost it so i remember walking up a street in manhattan and seeing it in the window of a record store and just saying oh new paul mccartney album and not feeling anything about needing to go in and get it or anything like that um uh, i was really keeping up a lot more with john lennon stuff um to some degree georgia stuff maybe 73 still maybe uh thinking of Ringo but uh, Paul the stuff I had heard I just didn't like an awful lot so I didn't get it when it came out um I probably had heard my love um over and over and over on the radio and wasn't crazy about that you know and again you asked me about 1973 I mean a lot of these things have really grown on me since I mean in the 80s uh, you know, it was a lot of my solo collecting really started more in the 80s because there was simply nothing left to buy of the group. And every now and then there was a hiatus in the bootleg world, which was mainly where I was living uh, and needing something to get. I began thinking, you know, I, I mean, maybe I ought to sort of catch up with some of these solo things that I've skipped and, uh, you know, so I, I came to Red Rose Speedway a bit late and didn't love it at first. I thought, OK, this is one of those early Paul McCartney albums that I skipped for possibly good reason. But, uh, you know, on the, with these deluxe archival sets um, and maybe it's because we're doing the podcast, too. It's not like now I can just listen to a record and say, 
uh, yeah, okay, fine, back on the shelf. I mean, now I have to listen to them a bit more closely and over and over and over. And I mean, even wildlife is growing on me to some degree. Uh, Aha! Well, parts of wildlife. I mean, you know, we talked last week. I mean, tomorrow's great song, Dear Friend. You know, there's the things I, I didn't like on wildlife, I still don't. The things I didn't like on Red Rose Speedway, I'm sort of coming around to liking because partly, you know, what Ken said about Paul as a melodic composer, I mean, who could argue with that, you know, as one of the great melodic composers? That's absolutely true. And there are a lot of pretty stunning melodies on this album. And My Love, I mean, it has that sort of gooiness that I always have sort of resisted in Paul's love songs. But reading in the book, you know, he gives a really good defense of love songs in the book for this thing. And, you know, and, and he says, you know, I, I understand people who feel that way and I understand why they feel that way. But why don't you look at it this way? You know, and I found it kind of convincing. I'm not going to sort of repeat his argument, but um, it it just made some sense of, you know, love songs as a genre and as a topic. And and I'm going to really shock Ken. Um, I like Loop. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, I like Loop for the same reason you do. It's 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 a little experimental. It's got some odd sounds. It's kind of a strange thing to do. It's not what people would expect of him or would have expected of him at the time. And uh, it kind of breaks up the album in a way where, you know, it comes after conventional songs, goes back into conventional songs, and all of a sudden, you know, what's this in here in the middle? And I really kind of do like it. Um, mm. Other things, too, you know, uh, the thing about Red Rose Speedway that I can see now, um, and also, you know, with working on this, uh, and working on this McCartney legacy project with Adrian Sinclair. And so we're spending a lot of time looking into the recordings of these things and, uh, uh, where they come from and all of that stuff. And so there are a, a lot of things, especially on the double album that really had their Genesis in Ram. You know, one of them is get on the right thing. That really is a Ram track or should have been a Ram track. Can't think why he held it back. Um, oh. But, uh, you know, if you look if you look in the book uh, at the end uh, on page 123, it gives the personnel, Paul, Linda, David Spinoza, Denny Sywell, recorded by Tim Geelan on 14th of October, 1970. So, you know, that basically is a Ram track. And some of the others, I mean, the thing about Paul uh, and leftover tracks is, first of all, he records a gazillion of them. And in most cases, I mean, he doesn't seem to have done a lot more with Get On The Right Thing, but in most cases, he'll take the track when he wants to revisit it, and the new guys in the band will add something to it, and so it becomes a Wings track, even if it was a Ram track. Um, mm. You know, or, you know, there's another one, uh, you know, The Great Cock and Seagull Race, which we've now had two versions of. We had one on the Ram Deluxe set, which was a mix made in July 71. And then the one on this set is made in December 71. And in between there, it was recorded in February 71. So in between there, the other guy, you know, not all of the other guys. I mean, really, I guess Denny wasn't on the original. And Paul, the, when Paul recorded that, it was just him. It was just him doing all the instruments. And the one we hear on the Ram album is that one in a mix. He then revived it in December 71, brought the rest of Wings into the studio. Uh, the rest of Wings, except Henry, who hadn't joined yet. And uh, or actually, as is, Greycock and Seagull race is on the wildlife box, not this box. Am I right about that or wrong? And it's it gets on, confusing. <laughs> and it's, I know it really does. I think the wildlife. second one is on wildlife. Yeah. Um, so that okay. one has new stuff from the rest of, of, of wings apart from Henry who hadn't joined yet, as I said. And, uh, and it's a completely different thing. I mean, one of them's four minutes, one of them's two and a half minutes, and it's basically the same basic track, but 
with new stuff added. And, and that was my point, really, um, that, that is germane to the Red Rose Speedway box, that um, when he returns to things, he doesn't just say, oh, yeah, that one, it's uh, extra, well, let's put it on. He, he usually revamps it to some degree, uh, adds new stuff, has other people in the band add new stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, so, I mean, this Red Rose Speedway is kind of an interesting glimpse of how he worked, you know. Uh, and the double album of Red Rose Speedway is an even more interesting glimpse of how he worked because there he's got more sort of extra stuff that I, I, I kind of like the double album. I think uh, I think I wish he put it out that way. It plays well. Mm. Well, the record company felt that it probably wouldn't do well. Right. So we had to whittle it down to just one. Right. But, you know, it's interesting that you bring all this up because the more you learn about when certain songs started, it's really fascinating how, like you said, he revisits them. Like, you know, all these years, because I have the Mary Had a Little Lamb single, Mm -hmm. the flip side, Little Woman Love, I always thought, was a wing song. But Little Woman Love really started during the Ram sessions Mm -hmm. to the point where it's one of the bonus tracks on Ram. Mm-hmm. But it's also a bonus track here mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> on Red Road Speedway. So what is it? Is it a wing song? Is it not a wing song? Right. And maybe I, I, I start thinking in Paul's mind, what constitutes what's wings? You right. know, I mean, Denny Sywell was on Little Woman Love. Mm-hmm. He was a member of wings, but Denny Lane wasn't on it. So and I was also fascinated to learn that a song like I Lie Around. Right. I Lie Around had David Spinoza on it. That's from the Ram Sessions, came out as a B-side for a wing single. But he revisited it because Denny Lane does some of the lead vocals on there. So obviously that had to be when Denny joined. Right. So, you know, there's all this crossover here between this this period of Ram Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. So sometimes I'm a little confused as to how Paul decides what makes bonus tracks for which album. Does it matter when it was started? Or when it was finished, right, right, um, you know, and he's he hasn't given all of the info here. I mean, one of the things I like about these box sets is that you know you get at the end a listing of all the personnel on the track and when it was recorded, when it was mixed, and you know that's that kind of stuff is what I live for. But if you look at I Lie Around, you know, it says Denny Lane and uh, you know Paul, Linda, David Spinoza, Denny Lane, and Denny Sywell. Uh, and recorded in New York, October 19th, 1970. I, I don't f- think Denny Lane was there. So no, when did Denny wasn't. Lane... No. So they're not, giving you, um, they're not giving you when the extra work was done on it, which is a pity, right, yeah. but I think we'll fill that in when the book comes out. <laughs> My thoughts actually about that, it's funny, um, because there is a lot of... Um, uh, connections between Ram Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway that I actually find myself getting confused over what was recorded where. And while the two of you were talking, you didn't mention something it, that I remembered. I remember this, but forgot the country dreamer, mm-hmm. you know, at the origins earlier on. Right. And I looked around. So Little Lamb Dragonfly, uh, a tune, uh, another tune that had its uh, genesis in the Ram sessions, you see the the Ram uh, group of musicians working on it. But there's Denny Lane, which uh, which meant that Denny, when they when Wings revisited it, when Paul dusted it off out of the Ram tapes, Denny added his backing vocals. And I would imagine it was the same type situation as with I Lie Around. You know, Paul had these this all of these tracks and uh, and, you know, dug them back out again, which then gets confusing when you're trying to tr- keep track of what songs started during what sessions, ended up on Red Rose Speedway, but the bonus track is on this box set. So, um, yeah, if, me- if you if you want to go that route, if Little Woman Love is a bonus track on Ram, then why isn't Little Lamb Dragonfly and Get On The Right Thing, an early mix of that on Ram? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know yeah right you know it opens up an interesting sort of topic that could go on forever but you know for people who liked ram and didn't like wildlife and then did like red rose speedway there's a, an obvious reason for that that wasn't obvious at the time the albums came out which is that 
Red Rose Speedway is in a way kind of Ram Part 2. And if Red Rose Speedway could have been a double album, Ram could have been a double album as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there definitely is enough material left over for another album there. And I wonder, I mean, we never hear anything about Paul wanting Ram to be a double album. But I kind of wonder if... if, if Ram had been a double album. I can you look at the McCartney album and everyone sort of says, Okay, fine, largely home recorded and so it's really just sort of a a shot across the bow of the Beatles in a way, you know, I'm I'm going off on my own, this is what I'm doing, and it's almost like an album of demos. That would make Ram really the first, you know, full fledged studio album. And if it had been a double album, you would have had double first, you know, with an asterisk albums from both George and Paul. That would have been interesting, you know, I think. Yeah. Right. right. Never um, thought about that. <laughs> for me personally, uh, Red Rose Speedway has always been very near and dear to my heart because, as they say, you always remember your first time and your first love. And for me, Red Rose Speedway was my first McCartney album. I uh, had a couple of singles, but Red Rose Speedway was my first full-length McCartney album, and I had it on cassette. I didn't get it when it was when it was currently released. It came out in 73 in the spring in the U.S. In, in late April, which was a little after my eighth birthday. I probably got my copy on cassette like about a year, year and a half later. But just hearing it on a mono Zenith tape recorder, which was my little cassette deck back then, it just had an ambiance to it and a vibe to it uh, as one of only a couple of two or three or four albums I had on pre-recorded cassette at that age that it just left an uh, indelible mark on me that has um, has really helped Red Rose Speedway become one of my favorite all-time McCartney albums. I, I don't think too many people would rank it up there in their top three or top five McCartney albums, but it would be up there for me. And portion of the reason is because it was my first and because I can still hear it playing, you know, through that mono speaker on that little portable tape recorder, Mm -hmm. Zenith tape recorder that I had. I too like loop, but I don't think I liked loop first Indian on the moon when it first, when I was first introduced to the album when I was younger, because I didn't get it. But as, uh, as I've gotten older, I mean, it's a showcase for some great bass playing on Paul's part. Mm-hmm. And actually sounds like it would probably was a pretty cool studio jam that they then embellished with uh, the effects and the different keyboard sounds and whatnot to make it sound like it was coming out of outer space. So um, I really enjoyed uh, digging through this box set uh, and hearing in good quality these tracks that i had only heard from bootlegs through the years that could have been on red rose speedway when it was still planned to be a double album it just seems that this box set this issue uh, of red rose speedway is so much more substantial than the wildlife set and there's so much more that you can sink your teeth into and of course at the center in my opinion other people uh might feel differently But the center of this is the presentation of Red Rose Speedway as the double album. All right. So jumping to this actual box set, disc one is the remastered album, the one that we've known since 1973, newly remastered. And then disc two gives you uh, the proposed double album that was ultimately rejected by the record company. And maybe Paul as well ultimately agreed it should be cut down to a single what I am curious about is what we see here in the box set on disc two as the double album doesn't necessarily mirror some of the potential track listings I've seen for the double album that I've seen from the past on bootlegs and various uh, research materials have listed other tracks and other track configurations as being the potential double album. So for example, on the box set, a song like Jazz Street or 1882 is treated as bonus audio, bonus track on the odds and ends disc. I was mm-hmm. always under the impression that those were two of the songs that would have been on the double album of Red Rose Speedway. But that's not the way Paul presents it here in this box set. 
another one more thing to point out about the double album the way it's presented here is that when it comes to vinyl, if you're a, a, a vinyl aficionado, the Red Rose Speedway album, the original album, the newly mat remastered version is not what you get on vinyl. If you want the vinyl, it's only available in the double album form. So that's an interesting little uh, twist to these to this to this reissue mm -hmm. that the vinyl of Red Rose Speedway is not the original album, but the double album, disc two of the box set. How do you feel about that? I, I mean, I guess it's fine. I mean, I'm I'm a little like you know, I feel like uh, for these box sets, I felt like um, very early on that um, once Band on the Run came out, they should all sort of mirror the physical appearance. All the future releases should mirror what Band on the Run was so that they would all look uniform on the shelf. It's kind of an anal approach, you know, and they would all kind of be presented in a certain way. Um, so in a way, I kind of wish that a, dub, a, a vinyl version of the standard Red Rose Speedway was available, maybe in addition to the double version, or maybe make it a triple album, which is redundant. Yeah. There's mm. one thing I think about that, uh, in that, the double album as presented, I mean, so far as I could tell, and I, I didn't A, B each track or anything, but uh, it, it looks like the stuff that is on the single Red Rose Speedway, those are the same tracks on the double I album. Believe. Not not different yeah. mixes, not different anything. And, and so in a way, I kind of think it might have been nicer of them on our wallets if they had said, here are the tracks missing from the double album. And you can make the double album yourself by taking, you know, tracks one, three, five, seven tracks, you know, from the Red Rose Speedway, and then these tracks, and put them in this order, and that's what we meant as the double album. Um, and so, f you know, for vinyl, I I'm kind of happy that they actually put out the double album because they've reissued these things a lot of times, and at least if you're gonna buy the vinyl of every release. You're getting something different, and you're getting all the tracks that were on the single Red Rose Speedway. So, I don't know. I, I don't think that was that bad a choice for the vinyl. And on the CD, I kind of think they could have just shown us how to assemble the double album instead of repeating a whole disc's worth of tracks. Right. So you'd, I, rather, you'd rather see that than, say, have for the double vinyl the actual album and then the disc of the bonus material as the second album? Well, you know, the double album as an experience is different than the album plus a disc of the missing material. You know, I, I kind of sure. like hearing it in the way that he wanted the double album to be. And he may have had, I mean, if you look at the, um, the listings in the book, there are photos of, uh, you know, tra tape boxes and acetate labels and stuff like that, that show he actually may have had a couple of different ideas about how the double album should be. But I like the idea of being able to experience the double album in at least one of the ways that they conceived it, which on vinyl, you know, you would have to be put out that way. On digital, that's a totally different thing because it's very easy whether you're playing it on a CD player or whether you're playing it on a playlist. It's very easy to move tracks around in different orders. And I mm -hmm. kind of, you know, that's why I think that for the box set, the, the, the CD set, but less so for the vinyl. Because you put on a side of vinyl, that's the side of vinyl. You're not going to skip from track to track in order to recreate a double album. You know what I mean? I mean, we would have done it in the vinyl days with our cassette recorders. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, right. but now that is way too much of a pain in the butt now that it, we can do it on digital just by moving tracks, you know, up and down the playlist. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, while you were talking, Alan, I just pulled up another a list here. Getting back to, and you did allude to this, that there may have been several different ideas that Paul had about what the double album would consist of. What we have now uh, in this box set and as the uh, standalone vinyl, you get a track listing. Uh, you get a, ru a running order of tracks. That, and, and there are things on, on it that this other configuration, there's differences, what I'm trying to say. I don't mean to get confusing because I'm a little confused here trying to 
there's arrows everywhere on my notes here. But on this one uh, listing of a potential plan for the double album that says that this dates from December 1972. Those could be the ones that are shown on page 78 of the book. It shows the four, the four disc sides. All right, so I Would Only Smile is included on in the box set double, version, double album version, but is not listed on this early, early plan of attack. Seaside Woman, another one that is now part of the double album here on the box set, was not included on this early, early plan from December 72. So I guess there was never any set order that was ever Well, there was out. because they made acetates of it. I mean, here's the one um, on, on page 78 of the book. Right. Um, they're dated December 13th, 72. I would only smile inside one. And Seaside Woman, where is that? Jazz Street is on that one. And Seaside Woman is on side four right before the medley. That's funny, because uh, I'm wondering what I'm looking at with the source. I don't know the source mm. of my list, which doesn't have Seaside Woman, has I Would Only Smile at the End of Side 2. The Mess I'm In ends the album at the end of Side 4. Hmm. The double album here in the box that opens with Night Out, on my early plan, Night Out is the second song on Side 3. So... Uh, we're probably getting, we're splitting hairs a little too much on something that may not have been etched in stone, what the final absolute track listing would have been had the record company given Paul the thumbs up. And now Paul has pieced this together here in 2018, how he envisioned it, or maybe what he thought was the best track listing is now what we hear on the box set and on the vinyl. Mm -hmm. of Red Rose Speedway, the double album. There could have been a number of proposed lineups. What I find really interesting in that on that page that we were just talking about from the book is that 1882 is in there. Now, 1882 is a source of frustration for me because um, there are three different recordings of 1882 that exist in this box set, and they're all on the bonus disc of material, and it's not on the double album. Mm-hmm. Now, you got a home demo of it, you've got a studio recording of it, you got a live recording of it. They worked this song, so apparently it must have been pretty important at the time, and yet it didn't make the album. And there's really no backstory about that particular song. We don't know anything about it. I think it's a really interesting song when you listen to it. I think the demo, which is one of the three versions in the box set, as you mentioned, Ken, on the uh, kind of bonus audio disc, uh, the demo was done during the McCartney sessions and then he brought it back and then it was done live during the 72 Wings tour. And this possibly erroneous list, which I've been referring to, this early configuration of the double album has the live version of 1882 as the next to last song on the mm. album uh, on track four of five on side four. So... Now that we've completely confused everybody on what is and isn't on Red Rose Speedway, the box set. Well, I'm looking in, in, the, in the booklet here for Red Rose Speedway. It's saying that home demo that you were just referring to, the piano one, was recorded at home, although the exact date is unknown. So I don't know if it's from the McCartney album. Time. From 70. Maybe, maybe, maybe just in 1970 it was recorded possibly at home. And the I assumption was made... You know, oh, 70G home must be coming yeah, out well, of the You know, the whole business of sorting out Paul McCartney's recording career, uh, I, I wonder, it's always because of him bringing things back and changing the orders is, you know, any any artist would do while they're making an album. I mean, we've seen different track orders for Sgt. Pepper in, in some of the, you know, uh, uh, paperwork that has, mm -hmm. has come and gone. Uh, you know, people experiment with things and uh, not to change the subject too much, but in this box set, there's also the DVD and there's the James Paul McCartney special. And that is a huge can of worms because what was shown in the U.S., is, which um, is largely 
what we have on the DVD here is different from what was shown in the UK. The UK had high, high, high. The US did mm -hmm. not. But the US version had Bluebird. In right. It. Bluebird was part of the acoustic medley at the very beginning, and right. that's not on this DVD. It's not on the set, and yet I have a file from ATV's archive that does not have Bluebird in it. And it was from way before this set came out. So I don't think it's a question of him removing it, which I, I've seen a lot of people on, you know, as, as this has gotten discussed on the Internet, people are saying, oh, he's just, you know, wrecking all of these videos, you know, and he you know, don't know what he's doing, all, all that stuff. But, you know, there are just a lot of different versions of James Paul McCartney that went out to different countries. What I would have done if I were putting this set together is I would have reconciled all of the versions so that if one country didn't have Bluebird, I put it back in. It, I would put High, High, High back in. I believe the UK one had High, High, High instead of Long Tall Sally. I'd have them both or have one of them as a bonus at the end or something. No. From what I've heard, the UK version had all four concert songs. There hey. was Long Tall Sally, The Mess, Maybe I'm Amazed, and High, High, High. Hmm. I thought they were missing one, and I thought it was Long Tall Sally, but you could be right. US didn't have High, High, High. I, I don't know. I really don't know, because you, you could argue that, uh, well, he's given us the High, High, High video on the same disc so maybe we don't need it but he's also given us four mary had a little lambs which mm -hmm. you know quite you know it, arguably is three too many maybe four too many you you can never have too many little lambs is what i've always <laughs> so um, I, I never i never have a problem with multiple videos for any song yeah i don't need but the only problem i have with these videos is the picture quality isn't all that great. It is not. You know, it's not like what the what the Beatles and Apple did with one, you know, where they scrub them so that they they look like they're brand new fresh promos. They they look like the old film promos that have um you know decayed a bit and are now transferred. I mean stuff that you get on the bootleg video market is not much worse looking than these. That's yeah. a pity. I mean, this is something that really has baffled me because I would have thought if I was Paul McCartney, every single thing I've ever recorded, audio or video wise, I would keep in the best of shape. You know, I would have it in pristine condition. Mm -hmm. uh, these look like they were not taken from from master recordings. And I don't know because they do say in the book that all four videos from Mary Had a Little Lamb were recorded at the BBC. And I believe it was all the same day. So does that mean that the BBC owns the rights to those? I don't really know. I don't know all the legalities involved, but I do know that the picture quality, there's lines on on the first one in particular. One of the videos has an upcut at the very beginning on the first chord. You know, it's like, that's really sloppy. Mm. I'm really surprised that it went out like that. Yeah. Well, well, I think what we've figured out here that in 2023, the 50th anniversary edition of Red Rose Speedway <laughs> will come in, and it will contain all of this stuff that that we're trying to sort through. Um, before we talk about the Bruce McMahon show, I just want to backtrack and summarize again what we've been discussing uh, and the contents of the deluxe box set. Once again, uh, just I'll start with just the audio. Um, so we know the disc one of the box set is the original Red Rose Speedway album issued in late April 1973. I think like a few weeks later or two weeks later in the UK on Apple, we get the 2018 remaster. That's disc one. That's the main Red Rose Speedway. That is not on vinyl, not the vinyl version. CD two is the double album. Uh, an 18-track album, if you count the medley, is one track. So you essentially have the standard Red Rose Speedway plus nine songs. Uh, and this is how it now comes out, Paul's uh, vision of the double album. This is the one now that we get. And all the speculation on the other tracks is speculation. Now, disc three of the box set is the bonus audio. That's where you get the singles Mary Had a Little Lamb, which I love that song. 
and Little Woman Love, and then the High, High, High Sea Moon single. I think Give, uh, Give Ireland Back to the Irish should have been included on this set, uh, simply because it's a wing single from 72. Why not start there? But that's splitting hairs. Give Ireland Back to the Irish is on the wildlife box. Uh, you then have the Live and Let Die. Uh, well, you have the song Live and Let Die, the single from 73. And then you get into what many box sets have, different mixes and whatnot, early mixes of uh, Red Rose Speedway tracks. Some of them pretty interesting, actually. Little Lamb Dragonfly with a guide vocal and Linda sharing the lead on Little Woman Love. And uh, then you get to the tracks that I was kind of trying to, uh, and I probably con confused matters. Some of the tracks that I've seen as potential candidates for the double album that are considered extra tracks that didn't make the double album here in the box set. 1882, Jazz Street, Thank You Darling, the studio version of The Mess, uh, just a cherry pick. And then you come to the video portion. DVD one has James Paul McCartney, which we were just discussing, discussing along with music videos. And then the second DVD, The Bruce McMouth Show which is being screened in theaters as we record this show tonight. Your thoughts, Alan and Ken, on The Bruce McMouse Show. The Bruce McMouse Show is kind of an interesting production. I can see why he didn't put it out. I'm really happy to see it just because we don't really have much video of Wings performing live at that point. And... The upside of the Bruce McMouth show is that most of it shows Wings performing live. Uh, and the downside is that the rest of it shows the Bruce McMouth show, which is a you know little story about mice who live under the stage. And, um, you know, OK, Paul has said that he's done it because he loves animation. And he said that he didn't end up putting it out partly because the animation wasn't really what he would have wanted it to be because he wanted it to be Disney. And he kind of belatedly realized that if you're not Disney, you're not going to get Disney, you know, quality yeah. animation. He said many other things too. He's also said that uh, when we interviewed the director, uh, Bruce Chatworth for the book. Uh, and, um, and he told us that, Paul told him at the time, this is for my grandkids. And it's coming out now when he actually does have grandkids. So that's kind of interesting. But there was some, I guess, doubt in Paul's mind about whether it would ever come out. Now, the other thing that I don't understand about Paul's approach to this is that he wanted the little mouse story in there because he likes animation. Okay, fine. And the other thing he said is, I think it will be boring for people to just watch the show. Hello? <laughs> You know, what is that? <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe even if he's right, I mean, I, I, I totally uh, am happy to say that I may not be like everybody else, to quote Ray Davies, um, or paraphrase. Mm. But I like seeing a video of a band performing. Um, I, I like seeing the band performing in a video of a band performing. I like going to concerts to see performers perform. Uh, and I would expect that, especially at the time, nobody had seen a, a whole concert of what Paul was up to post-Beatles. Uh, and here it is, you know, even if it's not a concert, it's, you know, different different performances from the European tour. Um, and so they're wearing different clothes and different cuts. And it, it doesn't matter, you know, it's it's still largely their stage set and it shows what wings was like then and i would much rather see that than the stupid mice so um i i think you've got a thing against mice named bruce that's the bottom line now <laughs> it could be i'm not fond of mice generally <laughs> so if bruce runs across your desk right now the show is over oh. right well, Bruce is um, over. <laughs> I thought that, I thought that I, I would have liked to have seen the project separated. You know, it could have been a cute concept to do a children's uh, short called uh, Bruce McMouse and, 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 and have a concert film. Mm -hmm. But it's 45 years later. And, you know, I honestly only knew in passing of what the Bruce McMouse show was until now. But the um, the live footage uh, really, and I really enjoyed it because I, I kind of knew this, but it was like justification 
to my beliefs. This was a, a rock and lineup in a different way than the Wings, the Jimmy McCullough, Joe English lineup was, which was a little bit more of a polished arena rock lineup. Mm -hmm. This was a, a, a great little theater, small club, even bar band that, uh, that they had going here. And I would have loved to have heard, you know, it's too bad the lineup didn't last all that long mm -hmm. uh, with Henry McCullough and Denny Sywell leaving by mid-'73. But uh, they were a good little band. And it's now really out there for everyone to see uh, on the live footage in the Bruce McMau show. Ken, yeah. your mouse thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, a little bit of what both of you have said. The biggest reason to watch this is for the live footage. Yeah. And kind of like what you said, Alan, I don't understand what it is about Paul. He has done this a few times in his solo career. He gets the impression that people don't want to see a pure concert. And aside from Rock Show, which I thought was wonderful, and some other concerts like at Red Square or Glastonbury, where it's all a pure concert, those are wonderful. When he doctors things up, like Paul is Live, which I thought was horrible, he, he has it in the back of his mind that just seeing a pure show is not interesting to the fans. And I think most of the fans want to see just a pure concert. Exactly. No frills, nothing. But at the same time, one of the luxuries you have in putting out a box set like this is that you can put out everything that went on at the time, whether it was hit or miss. And I think that it's interesting that Paul came up with this idea. You know, when I watch this with my wife, we both watched this together for the first time uh, a week ago. We didn't say anything to each other as we're watching it. And when it was all over, we looked at each other and we had the same thought. Where's the animation? When yeah. you think about it, if you add up all the time, and this whole this entire film was, I believe, 52 minutes, there might be five minutes of animation in the entire thing. So for all this buildup about mixing animation with live footage, there wasn't that much animation. So I think that he didn't really try to finish off the project whether it was going to work or not. There isn't that much of a story as far as the mice are concerned. Bruce McMouse had this career in show business, and he wanted to help out Paul during this concert. And that's about all that you know. There's a little orchestra of mice that play for my love. You know, there's not that much going on storyline as far as the mice are concerned right. here in the, in the film. So if you're going to do it and you want to mix animation, put in a lot of, a lot of animation. Um, so I think that, you know, it wasn't fully realized, this project, but it's nice to know that it can come out in this form, in a box set, so you can know that Paul had this idea, which I thought was very Disney-esque, mixing live footage with animation is what they did in Mary Poppins. I think he was pr probably trying to, he was thinking of the same thing for something like this. The live footage is wonderful. I even don't mind, there are times, and this was uh, put on Facebook and on, uh, and on the internet and YouTube, they made a separate video for wildlife. And they're mixing that with animal footage. And, you know, it's like a commentary. You see people on the street and traffic and pollution and congestion and making that all a message, mixing that with footage on stage, which I think really works. You got to see what this band was like live. And they really became a great band. And, um, you know, between this and the live CD that accompanies the Super Deluxe box set, from which, by the way, I noticed some of those live recordings were taken from the same live performances from Bruce McMouse. Mm -hmm. It's really very enjoyable as a live concert. You know? And you also get to hear all this material that Paul was doing early on with Wings that he never released later on as a live recording. So it's great in that regard. And, and uh, I have no idea how much sweetening shall we say, was done in the studio for some of these uh, recordings. I did notice that Seaside Woman, that's the studio recording there hmm. that's used in this film. And uh, I'm pretty sure Big Bar in Bed was as well. But just about everything else is live. So it's still an enjoyable film to watch. It's nice that in a box set you can throw all these little extras, all these goodies in there. So just to know this was something that Paul thought of at the time, it didn't fully work. But, you know, just to know this was an idea of his, it can be released in this kind of a format. So I really love the fact that 
it's one of the bonus elements along with James Paul McCartney, which I think is, you know, a big plus Mm -hmm. in this box set. And there was also, we should mention that there was that live black and white uh, cut from Liverpool 73. That's another thing. That's something I don't think I've ever seen before um, on the main DVD. Uh, But Alan, the picture quality was awful for that. I know. It's okay. (laughs) You can live with that? Well, it's not something I'd watch all the time, but it is yet another performance that is now within our hands, see? <laughs> well, I mean, it's possible in the, in, in the case of the Live and Let Die live performance that that's the best that they could do with the, the, the footage that was available. Whenever I think about quality of archival recordings, I can't help. I'm a huge King Crimson fan. And um, Robert Fripp wouldn't hesitate to release something of historical importance, even though it sounds like it was recorded on a cassette deck under a pillow in the men's room downstairs from where the performance was taking place. Mm -hmm. So perhaps in the case of this live uh, Live and Let Die, that's the best that they could do with, uh, with the footage. Could be. You know, when I was starting, I I just wanted to finish a thought that I started before and got sidetracked about my love and got sidetracked on the thing about, you know, love songs and all that. But the one thing I wanted to say is that for me, the guitar solo in that is incredibly durable. I mean, it's an it's a beautiful solo. And even whatever I feel about the song, that almost that makes it worth it. That's that solo of Henry's. And, you know, the sad thing is, the sad thing is about that solo, that while Paul was so complimentary towards Henry that he loved that solo, Mm -hmm. he wanted him to play it that way every time. Right. And that caused a lot of stress between Henry and Paul. Yeah. And that's not something that musicians usually do, play it the same way every single time. And, um, yeah, I always think about that when it comes to my love. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add one thing, because... um, you know, a lot of people talk about the double album, and I think that it's a great concept here, what he did. But for me personally, I really like the disc of bonus material even more. And probably because all the other stuff that made up the double album, I knew those songs already. So it wasn't really something that was so shocking to me. If anything, it's the experience of listening to these songs in that sequence that made it interesting. But knowing all that, all those songs anyway, which had been bootlegged already, either on Hot Hits and Cold Cuts, or they were songs that made B-sides, you know, like um, like I Lay Around, for example, Country, uh, Country Dreamer. Dreamer, you know, Night Out was part of Hot Hits and Cold Cuts. When it comes to the bonus material on, on the, uh, the one disc of just bonus material, I like hearing how songs progress, or earlier versions. And there are some noticeable differences in the early mixes of some of those songs that I thought were really interesting. Just the mere fact that there's an early mix of Little Lamb Dragonfly, and basically Paul only has a few lines right. in the song he's figured out. But everything else about that song, the whole arrangement is all figured out. The fact that you know in his mind this is how he works. For a lot of people, and I think for most people, when they write songs, and this is not everybody... Most people write melodies first, and then they fit in words to fit it. Elton John was the exact opposite (laughs) with Bernie Taupin. Bernie Taupin handed him a set of lyrics, and Elton just came up with melodies very quickly. But Paul and most writers write melodies first. But in the case of Little Land Dragonfly, he's got the whole arrangement sorted out there. Right. So just learning that, I found fascinating. Certain things that are missing... Like on um, Big Barn Bed, there's an early mix, and there's a part where you would hear, I think the words are, and I'm not, yeah, and I'm not. That's yeah. nowhere in the song. That's something that has to be developed on later on. Same thing with what we experience with Tomorrow on the Wildlife Box set. There are parts of that song that are missing where Paul had to fill in the holes. Mm-hmm. And just knowing that, um, Get On The Right Thing is very interesting. There's a little bit more guitar work in it. And it ends with just vocals, you know, and uh, it's just a really cool ending to the song. And, um, you know, I love hearing the development of a song, what gets used that doesn't work, that gets taken out or when things aren't finished. And then you had to add elements to the song. 
And you learn that in these early mixes. I wish there were more of those for me personally. So, so see, if he gave us a roadmap to the double album instead of repeating the stuff that's on disc one on the double album, he could have put more of that on the set. Which brings us to the 50th anniversary box coming in 2023. <laughs> but in, in any event, so we've talked for an hour and change about audio and some video. How about kind of summarization on uh, the uh, literature that comes in the uh, box set, the books and the information? Uh, what do you guys think about um, how the Red Rose Speedway story is told in print? I think the wildlife story is told a lot better in the wildlife book than the Red Rose story is uh, Red Rose Speedway story is here. But um, you know, reading the essays is one thing. The books themselves are kind of another, and there are some great photos in here. Uh, and what I really like in this this particular book, uh, apart from you know tape boxes and tracking sheets, I always love to see that stuff. But there are those. Um, sort of extras that are put in a couple of little pouches. And mm. I don't know if you've taken yours out and looked at them, but there are some things that um, actually don't belong in here, but I'm really happy to have. Like, for instance, the, the he has the lyrics to Hold Me Tight, but it's not the Hold Me Tight in the medley. It's a, a 1963 letter from a fan to Paul wanting to get a picture of him because she's gone into all the shops and looked and can't find one and she goes to you know sees them in the cavern whatever and on the back he's written the lyrics to the beatles hold me tight that's in here now i wonder was that just was that intentionally done to throw people off i have no idea but i'm glad it's in here because it's uh you know being more of a group guy uh that plays to my other interests so hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I can't think why it's in here, but it's great that it is. Alan has the one copy. That's like finding the golden <laughs> ticket in, in the Willy Wonka. So right, Alan... Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe someone He's just put the wrong thing tick. in. <laughs> and it's also got, you know, it's got some doodles. Of, in fact, it looks like a looks kind of like a doodle of John in a way. <laughs> but yeah. Mm. Uh, but there's also, you know, the handwritten lyrics on a separate sheet to get on the right thing. And um, there are some autographed postcard kind of things. So um, there's lots of good stuff in the book. Um, I, I think the books are, generally speaking, pretty well done in terms of stuff they give you. There's, there's always more stuff they could give you, of course, but a, a lot of outtakes of the, of the front cover. Mm -hmm. Lots of studio shots. I always love seeing studio shots. Paul with a sitar. Yeah, well, there, well, there is a song, um, and I and I didn't jot it down which one it was, but it, I believe it was in tragedy. Was it tragedy? Right, and I'm thinking, oh, there's a sitar in there. I wonder. Yeah. yeah. You know who's playing that? If it's Henry or is it Paul or Denny? Well, let me look at the back of the book here, and I'll tell you. I'm. I don't really like those uh, hand. Uh, you know those extra physical items that they give out you know, postcards and whatnot. I kind of just wish they had all that stuff in a book. I don't know. That's just me. Well, at times, Paul has done that with handwritten lyrics, like in Ram. It's yeah. kept in a separate book. But, um, I mean, when it comes to the packaging of these box sets, when it comes to the books and the photos, you know, I have to give Paul an A-plus and all these box sets because she gets so much material, so many photos from Linda that you've never seen before. I love the fact that there's all kinds of information that you never knew before in these books. Like, right. for example, Live and Let Die. I mean, this is this is a minor thing to some people. There's a whole little bit going in here about Ray Cooper being on the record and that he contributed percussion uh, for that song. Little Lamb Dragonfly. If you look at the back of this book where it has the the musician's credits, it actually says, this is the first time I've ever seen this. Orchestra arranged by George Martin. Huh. Right. Yeah. Okay. I never knew George Martin had anything to do with that song at all. I did hear for years that originally Paul proposed uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly for the Rupert the Bear full-length feature film, things like that. There was the possibility of Wings going on tour at the end of 1972 to do a, a, a brief UK tour. 
and there's a list of possible songs in the set list. Junk was considered as a live performance. You've got sketches, as Alan said, Bruce McMouse, sketches of that in the book, um, set lists in here. There's actually photos, I'm kind of surprised they included this, of the drug bust in Sweden. (laughs) Oh, Linda. This isn't just about Red Rose Speedway. It's everything pre-Red Rose Speedway that led up to the album. So that includes Live and Let Die. It includes James Paul McCartney and all of that. And... um, you know, original lyrics, sometimes you see in the lyric sheet something that's slightly different. I noticed that in the lyrics for High, High, High and The Mess, there's different lyrics. Learning that Great Cock and Seagull Race originally was going to be the B-side of High, High, High instead of Sea Moon. Little things like that I found really interesting. But uh, this book for Red Rose Speedway is tremendous. I love all the work in there. And in particular, I do love the handwritten lyrics, and I think that it's remarkable and Paul's been doing this in so many of his box sets, how these pages that you pull out look like he just wrote them. I mean, it's all done digitally, but how he's able to do that, I don't know the technology, (laughs) but it looks like he just handed it to you from when he first wrote these lyrics. And it's amazing when you witness something like that. It's a really nice touch to add to, to the book. And then on top of that, for Bruce McMouse, there's actually a pad that they give you with the whole script of what the mice are saying for the film. And then there's also a book, uh, Wings Over Morocco, when they visited Morocco and went on vacation. And um, I think it says in there that's where Paul came up with plans for the James Paul McCartney TV special. There's lots of photos in there that you probably never saw before. And they stayed at the Mamunia Hotel, Mm -hmm. is where we got the song. So there's so many things they pack into this box set. When it comes to the actual books and photos, you can't complain at all what Paul gives you as far as that's concerned. The only thing I ever complain about with his box sets is whether or not he gives enough audio and video bonus material. And I think in Red Rose Speedway, he gave you, you know, a substantial amount. So I'm super pleased with the Red Speedway box set. I, I just summarized what the two of you said about the books. Ditto. I mean, because you, you really hit, nailed all my thoughts. And as I said at the beginning of the show, I felt there was so much more with the audio to sink your teeth into with Red Rose Speedway than there was, not to knock it, with the Red the Wildlife box. There's more the music-wise to Red Rose Speedway than there is Wildlife. So, you know, it's uh, it's it, it was great to have this period in Wings's history examined as deeply as it has been well, through these two box sets because I think the early lineup uh, with Denny Sywell and then Henry McCullough joining, the early lineup kind of gets lost in the shuffle, possibly because it's the earliest. It's a long time ago. And um, I think it's a lineup that, that uh, deserved closer inspection which it gets through these two box sets. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to pay tribute to Henry McCullough and his talents and, uh, and Denny Sywell, who we're fortunate enough to still have with us today. Like we mentioned last week that Denny has a jazz trio, just put out an album last, late last year, mm-hmm. uh, called Boomerang. So collectively, a great way to learn a lot and realize how pretty cool the early Wings incarnation was. Definitely. I've, despite the fact that I've heard these recordings all these many years, I've really come to appreciate this lineup more now through these box sets. Oh, and absolutely. In particular, uh, I've been listening more carefully to Denny Seibel's drumming, and I thought it was just outstanding. Mm-hmm. The fills that he brings to certain songs, especially I really you know, love Love is Strange, the drumming that he does on that. But yeah. Get on the Right Thing... Some of those fills in Big Barn Bed are just so spot on. Just what the, the songs call for. He was so perfect for that band. And um, growing to love Henry McCullough for his lead guitar work, too. More of a bluesy sound. Yeah. You can definitely tell the difference between Henry McCullough and Jimmy McCulloch and Lawrence Juber. Very different. Right. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Same way you can tell the difference between Benny Sywell, Joe English, and Steve Holly. Mm-hmm. So, and Jeff um, Burton, yeah. Yeah, I just wish that we would have a full, complete 
uninterrupted concert with this early lineup. And I also kind of wish, and one of the things that I love about the live stuff that has come out is that you do get Linda with the song Seaside Woman. You get Denny, Denny Lane with I Would Only Smile. You don't get Henry McCullough, who had a song in 1972 that they did live, Henry's Blues. Mm -hmm. And um, it would have been nice to have him represented. Denny Lane also did a song in 72 uh, called Say You Don't Mind which was actually a hit in the UK for Colin Blundstone of the Zombies. And they used to play it in Wings. I would have loved to have seen that. And it would have been an even better representation of all the members of Wings. So, yeah. But for what we get in this box set, it, it's tremendous. I think, uh, you know, Paul did a great job and his team for Red Rose Speedway. All right. Well, uh, I think we've uh, reached the end of the Speedway. Uh, the detour, <laughs> sign, the stop signs are uh, are ahead. I realized that our next show uh, will be the first one that I've done, I think, since I joined Things We Said Today, that isn't involving a new release. Because uh, I joined with Egypt's, the, this program with the Egypt Station show. And from that point on, it went to Lennon videos and Imagine box sets and White Albums and and White Album books, and now Wings albums. So uh, who knows what we'll be talking about in the future about releases, but uh, our future um, shows immediately will be uh, shows that will be topic and interview-based. And uh, I, we may very well have a special guest in line for a show coming very, very soon. Stay tuned for that, just in case that doesn't come together. But we have a potential <laughs> cool guest coming up <laughs> so uh we'll wrap things up with uh, our personal info to roll the credits on this show i'm darren devivo from wfuv 90.7 fm in uh, the new york city metropolitan area uh we stream at wfuv.org and can be heard on our app and you can hear me and these are eastern times uh monday through thursday nights 10 p.m till two in the morning and uh, then again at midnight Sunday night slash Monday mornings till 2 a.m. And then there's the uh, FUV Music Secondary Channel, which you can listen to on HD radio or HD2 signal, 90.7 FM HD2, or stream it online or on the app from noon Saturday to midnight Sunday nights. Yes, that's a 36-hour DeVivo marathon. Help us all. Uh, and you can... <laughs> You can reach me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, that email address, or go to Facebook and like my radio page, which is Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. You want that page. And now over to Alan. Okay. Um, you can reach me most easily on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can reach all of us by email at Things We Said Today Radio Show. That's one word, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab. And we have a Facebook page, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. Ken? My email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can reach me at my website as well, kenmichaelsradio.com. Since Darren just mentioned it, I am giving away Denny Sywell, the new uh, CD from the Denny Sywell Trio, his jazz combo, called Boomerang, which you can win on my Beatles trivia and games page, along with one copy left I have of Egypt Station, one copy left I have of the Imagine 2 CD set that just came out. And a whole bunch of other great prizes. That's on the Beatles Trivia and Games page. And since I never really mentioned it, I do have a live broadcast of my show, Every Little Thing, which is heard Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on WNHU in West Haven, Connecticut, which you can stream at WNHU.org. My show combines Beatle and solo Beatle music, has Beatle news, and also has interesting thematic sets. This is what I've been doing on the radio for most of my career since 1982. News, themes, trivia. And uh, you can catch it, like I said, Wednesdays, 8 p.m., WNHU.org. 
All right. So uh, for Alan and for Ken, I'm Darren. Things we said today, and I uh, have hinted our next show may very well have a very special guest. Uh, So I hope you uh, will be there to hang out with us again next time. Take care. Take care.